everyone and welcome to a new video. If you are new here, my name is Gabby and I make bookish and journaly teacher videos whenever I can find the time. And in 2020, I did not find time. But you know, it seems like 2020 was a roughie for everyone, so we're just gonna give ourselves grace and move on. That being said, one of the most positive parts of 2020 was that I was able to read 178 books. My original goal was to read 200, but once the pandemic started and I was under stay-at-home orders, I really didn't want to read when I was at home. But I am super, super grateful that I was able to read as many books as I was able to, and I found a lot of really great books that I love that I'm so excited to share with you guys today. As you can see in the title, this is my best books of 2020, my favorite video to make every year. I actually have been filming this video for the past eight years. You can go back eight years and see little baby Gabby. Thank God for the glow up, but you can see it. I love making this video. It's just one of my favorite parts of booktube and I enjoy just seeing what everyone loved this past year. So that being said, let's just get started on the book. I'll be sharing them in chronological order of how I read them and not necessarily by um, the best book versus the least best book. I couldn't do it this year, you guys, I'm sorry. The first book that I read in 2020 that I absolutely loved was Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers. This book is a nonfiction book that essentially is just talking about how in situations that you're uncomfortable, you will feel a fear, but you should do it anyway because that fear cannot stop you from doing the things that you want to do in your life. This is my mom's copy so all of these stickies are not mine, but if I would have read it physically, I probably would have put as many stickies in this book as I wanted to. This book was a really, really great book for me to start off the year with because I have some anxiety, as many people do, about things that they want to do in their lives, but we just gotta power through and do it anyway because the feeling of not trying and not knowing how things would have been is way worse than trying and actually knowing the result. Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers, one of my favorite books at the beginning of this year. The next book I read that just completely blew me away which wasn't a surprise, is Landline by Rainbow Rowell. I was so adamant about not reading this book in high school. Why? I don't know. I was a weird duck in high school, as you can see if you watch my old videos. This story follows a woman named Georgie who's kind of having a tumultuous time in her relationship right now. It's like around the Christmas time, holidays, and her, she's supposed to go with her husband and her kids to her husband's family's house, but all of a sudden she realizes that she wants to stay and um, do stuff at work instead. And so that kind of puts like a barrier in their marriage and things are kind of going like awry. She ends up going home to her childhood home and there is a landline there. And when she picks it up, she can talk to her husband from the past before they were married. And so she just kind of like, we go on this adventure with her as she's having conversations with her husband, the husband that she fell in love with years ago, comparing that to the relationship that they have right now. I teared up. I was really like just in my feels over this book because Rainbow Rowell knows how to do that. This is definitely one that just made me think and really made me invested in the relationship and the characters that were present. So if you're looking for something like that, Landline by Rainbow Rowell is your book. The next book I read was Front Desk by Kelly Yang. I am a fourth grade teacher for those of you who don't know. So I do read a lot of young adult and middle grade fiction. This book follows the main character, Mia, a 10 year old who is the daughter of immigrants and they all live in a motel and they help run this motel. And we really just get to see the challenges of being um, one of the first generation in America. The types of thing a child who speaks English and their parents might not speak fluent English has to go through. This book really touches on the themes of racism, immigration, and standing up for what you believe in. I most definitely will be reading it to my students, but it's also one that adults should pick up because it is lovely. The next two books I'm going to put together, even though they are separate books, and that is Boys and Sex by Peggy Ornstein and Girls and Sex, also by Peggy Ornstein. And both of these books follow Peggy Ornstein as she interviews first girls and then boys on sex and what they learned and what they didn't learn and just the things that you don't really get to learn in school. As someone who is really interested in sexology and sex education, this was such a wonderful read. I read Boys and Sex first because I was not aware that Girls and Sex was a book until after I read this one. And this one was really, really special to read as the first one for me because 
Peggy really unpacks some of the toxic masculinity and things that we think in our society that boys need to be to be a manly man and all that different kind of stuff. I also really enjoy this one because Peggy really, when she wrote Girls and Sex, didn't really think about non-binary people and trans people as much as she did in this book. And so I think that these two books together, if I were to ever teach high school sex ed or health, I would definitely read excerpts of because even as myself as a 24 year old um, person, I learned a lot and felt myself knowing that if I would have read these books when I was in high school, it would have been a really really validating experience for me so these two books nonfiction, really great i am so grateful that i read them in 2020. this summer was a lot um with the murders of brianna taylor amon arbery there was just so much as a black person i was trying to take care of myself but then i also knew that i wanted to do something and so i co-founded a anti-racist book club at my workplace just so then we can start really unpacking some of the internalized racism that we encounter or perpetuate every day and so our first book was white fragility by robin d'angelo and y'all robin d'angelo went off i've had a lot of people ask me if i like or dislike this book because it's written by a white woman about race and racism I think that that is a really, really valid question. When it comes to this book, I think that Robin D'Angelo has done something really, really wonderful in the fact that sometimes when you are perpetuating or could possibly be unknowingly perpetuating racism or racist acts or bias or discrimination or prejudice, you don't want to hear it from someone who's experiencing that because it can feel like an attack. It probably is not an attack, but that's just how it can be received. And so Robin D'Angelo, a white woman, used her privilege to kind of just be like, listen, this is how brown and black people are seeing things. And if you're feeling uncomfortable, good. And so as a black person reading this book, I was just like screeching and squealing because she gets it. She's not putting it in a cookie cutter way. She is very simply saying, these are the issues. It is worse than you think, but let's figure out what we can do to be anti-racist. And so this book is one that's going to stay with me. I read a lot of books about social justice and anti-racism this year, and many of them were written by black and or brown authors. I think that those are wonderful books, but for someone who is just getting started in anti-racist work and is still really in that right fragility place of like, I don't understand, this is where I would start with that person. So this one was really great. I think that I'm probably going to be referencing and recommending this book for the rest of my life. Another book that I read is Strangers Assume My Girlfriend Is My Nurse by Shane Burkaw. And over the summer, as I was doing a lot of my anti-racist work, I also realized that I'm a person who has privilege in other places. I might not have privilege when it comes to my race, but when it comes to my ability, I definitely have privilege. And that is something that I have not been really focusing on um, and I wanted to change that. So the first book that I read in my kind of disability activism learning was Strangers Assume My Girlfriend Is My Nurse by Shane Burkaw. Shane is a writer and a blogger and he also has spinal muscular dystrophy. And this is his second book. It's like a memoir, but you don't really have to read them in order because I did not. And this book just really goes into some pretty eye-opening stories about just the things that Shane has to go through every day living in his body and having the disability that he does with having also an able-bodied girlfriend. Now wife, follow them on YouTube because they're so cute. And honestly, this book really opened my eyes to some of the crap that people with disabilities have to go through that I have not even thought about because in my able-bodied body, I don't have to think about that. Things like people stopping him in restaurants and laying their hands on him and starting to pray because they think that something is like wrong with him and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just like, the audacity, ew, like what? This book really, really did open my eyes to some things. And I think that it's a really, really great place to get started if you're starting to look into disability and the privilege that comes with being being able-bodied. I also really want to say that Shane is like a cis white man and he recognizes that and mentions that. I can't remember if it's in his vlogs, on his YouTube channel, or in this book, but this is only one story of someone who has 
a disability. D the disability community is very, very diverse and Shane's voice is only a small voice in that. So read this, but then also do other research and read other things because every voice is different and each story is going to be different from the next. And so taking that into account with the privileges that people do and do not have, everyone's story is going to be really different. Shane Just Assume My Girlfriend Is My Nurse by Shane Baraka was a really, really great read for me to get started in learning more about the disabled community. And then I think my favorite book that I read this year when it comes to race is So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijoma Lowe. I feel like this year I really came to an understanding that there are some books that just help define you as a person. And these books don't have to be your favorite books. They're just books like if someone was like, I want to get to know this person, hand me five or six books that help explain them. This book is on my list. And I'm realizing that I probably need to make a video of all the books that are on that list. But this one, I love this book because Ijoma Alo just really goes into some of those questions that people ask me all the time. Why is it fair for people to get scholarships for their race? I don't really like it when black people talk like this. Why do people blah, 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 all those things. And I'm like, I feel in my heart and I know that that has bias within it, but I, I'm not a researcher and I don't understand all of the history because we're not taught it in schools, but I know that this is like in my soul. How can I explain it? This book explains it really, really succinctly. I think that this is the book that I would give to people after reading White Fragility. I would hand them this one because after you get the concept of what's messed up in our society, now you need to hear it from a black woman's perspective because even though Robin D'Angelo does know what she's talking about, she hasn't experienced it. She has. I, I have so many positive things to say about this book. Please, please, please pick up. So you want to talk about race. It's life-changing. The next book was also a really life-changing book, Anti-Diet by Christy Harrison, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating. In this book, Harrison really just goes into the fact that our society sucks when it comes to body image and doing things with our bodies. And we don't have to go into all of that. Like we can just be. And literally after reading this book, I really had to reflect on how mean I was to myself, how much internalized fat phobia I had, how I was so scared of certain things because other people would ask me like, why are you having a third piece of pizza? Or why this or why that? No, I'm not answering to people anymore. And this book really, really helped me get to that place. There's just so many things that came to me from this book. Honestly, this book changed my life. Literally, I am never going on a diet again. I have never been more happy in my life. I finally feel like food is not something that I am fighting with. Ah, I can't, I just cannot hype up this book enough. And then another book that really just like, oh, you guys, My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. So this book really explores the relationship between a teacher, and his student, Vanessa. And it has parallel like timelines that we're following. So we're following Vanessa as a 15-ish, 14-year-old girl at a boarding school when she has a relationship with her teacher and all of the psychological things that go into that. And then we're also following um, a timeline in 2017 where Vanessa's like in her late 30s and that teacher just recently got accused of sexually assaulting a student and we kind of just kind of see the parallels of what's going on because 15 year old Vanessa is really excited, is really happy to finally have someone love her and all that kind of stuff. Whereas 30 something year old Vanessa is really struggling with like what is happening in her life and what does this mean for her to not really want to help this girl who is trying to get this teacher indicted. I'm a teacher and I really enjoy reading teacher-student relationship books because it's like watching a train wreck in like slow motion. Like some people like true crime. This is my true crime because like never in my life, like the amount of trouble you would get into for having a relationship with a student just freak, like it freaks me out. So reading like the backstory and like trying to understand like the why, oh, but this book, like it was just, 
There were so many things. The writing was beautiful. The topic, like, it was so hard to listen to because, like, you can understand where Vanessa is coming from in both timelines. And I just, I feel like this book needs to win so many awards. It needs to win so many awards because it just, mm, so good. I'm gonna stop talking before I just, like, pop a vein in my forehead or something like that. It is so good. Please read it. Please read it. The next two books that I want to talk about are graphic novels, and they are the first two volumes in the Heartstopper comic book series. Oh, you guys. Oh, oh my gosh. They follow these two young boys in high school as they, like, fall in love. And for those of you who have been here for a while, you know we love a good queer story on this channel. We love it. We live for it. We just... Mm. And these, like... Oh, they're so cute. <laughs> they're so adorable. Squeals galore. Just like, oh, gorgeous. Super easy to read. Um, the art is gorgeous. They are just, pick them up, pick them up. The last book that I read this year that ended up on my best books list is unsurprisingly, The Midnight Library by Matt Hang. This book plays with the idea of there being a library in between life and death where when you're in that place in between life and death, you go to this library and all of the books are lives that you could have lived if something was different in your life. And we follow a character who is in that place looking at the lives that she could have led if she would have made different decisions. And your guys, so good, like, I can't even explain the feelings that this book gave me. It was so beautifully written. I read it at the right time that I needed it. It just spoke to all of me in all of the languages. I don't even know if I can say anything more about it. There, it's, it's so good. Please read it, please, please read this book. It, I'm so, yeah. We're done. That is all of the books that I had to share with you that I loved in 2020. I will leave down my Goodreads books read in 2020 if you would like to see all 178 books that I read this year. Have you read any of the books that I read this year? If you have, or if you haven't, or if you're interested in reading any of them, please interact with me in the comments. I would love, love, love to talk with you about it. Also in the comments, leave your video. If you made a best books of 2020, I definitely have been binge watching all of those as much as I can. Thank you all for joining me on this video. It is my favorite video to film every year. And thank you for those of you who have been here since video one in 2012. Um, you're a real one. So thank you so much for watching this video. Have a blissful day and I will see you in the next one.